Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Colossians, which we began, what, two weeks ago? So we're still in chapter 1. We're in chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. We ended last week with verse 14 and the statement that in, in whom, that is, in God's beloved Son, in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And now he tells us how it is that's possible for Christ to have accomplished that in the next paragraph. He is, verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him... All things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In the play, Julius Caesar, Cassius says to his fellow conspirator, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Blaming our problems on other things doesn't fix them. We have to change things. That's true. But there's more than advice in that statement. It speaks to a big question and an old question. Who is in charge? Is it man? Are we self-directed or are there other forces at work? Most Romans in Caesar's day believed that the stars did influence their lives and events. All across the ancient world, men studied the movement of the planets in order to learn the future. Even ancient Jews believed that. In the uh, Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, there is a, a tile floor from an ancient synagogue with the 12 signs of the zodiac around the 12 tribes of Israel. Even today, lots of people consult astrologers and horoscopes. Some of that seems to be the doctrine that these false teachers who had come to Colossae were teaching. So who is in charge of this world? The stars and planets, fate, man... Paul's answer is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, in what F.F. Bruce called one of the great Christological passages of the New Testament. In it, Paul shows that planets and angels don't govern our world or determine the course of life. Man, ultimately, doesn't either. It's the one who created the stars and made man, the Lord. He is in charge. Paul's teaching in the book of Colossians is that Christ is preeminent and sufficient. In this passage, he states that Christ is the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer of the universe. In all three, he is benevolent, but especially as Savior. That's the emphasis. In verse 14, he said, In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And now He shows how that can be. It is because of who He is that He's able to save forever. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That word image is the word for portrait. 
An ancient papyrus text was discovered in which a Greek soldier in Italy wrote home to his father and added that he had sent a little portrait of himself. That's this word. Christ is the image. He is the portrait, the true representation of God because he himself is God. The second person of the Trinity. Only God can picture or reveal God. Christ is that. So when Philip, in John 14, asked the Lord to show them the Father, Jesus could say, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Not physically, of course. God is spirit. No man can see God and live. He dwells in unapproachable light. But Christ, his Son, has revealed him in his incarnation. As Charles Wesley said, and as we sing every Christmas, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Christ. He's revealed Him. He reveals His character. He reveals His life and power. He is the exact portrait of God. In addition, Paul says, he is the firstborn of all creation. That is a title of privilege and authority, the firstborn. It means he's the heir of all things. He is the governor of the universe. It's really an Old Testament term. In Deuteronomy 21, the law is stated that the firstborn son is always the heir of the fortune and the one who becomes the head of the family, head of the clan. So this is a title of authority and rank. It has nothing to do with time or uh, a beginning of existence, though it has been interpreted like that by cults such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and heretics like uh, Arius. Arius was a popular preacher in Alexandria, Egypt in the early 300s. He had trouble with the doctrine of the Trinity. And this whole idea that there's one God and three persons. And it is a difficult doctrine. J.I. Packer, in one of his books, said that the doctrine challenges us with perhaps the most difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. It is not easy, but it is true. Arius would have agreed it is difficult, but he didn't believe it was true. He denied that Christ is eternal and taught that he has a beginning. He is the highest of God's creatures, but still a creature. And he, st he cited this verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, to support that. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He's, he's the first of all beings to be created. What could be plainer than that? And it seemed plain to a lot of people. They didn't have to strain their minds to understand how God could be, how, th how three could be one. And that heresy spread like wildfire, particularly in the eastern part of the church, the Greek-speaking part of the church, which was much more speculative. But it's surfaced all through the history of the church. In the Middle Ages, there were the Albigenses who held to a lot of different ideas that were heretical, but this was one of them, that Christ is a created being. And then there were the Socinians during the Reformation, and then during the Enlightenment, there were the, the Deists, and then in modern times, the Unitarians, and then, as I mentioned, the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity and would find support for their position in uh, this verse. But e even if the title firstborn might suggest that Christ was included among created things, verse 16 excludes that interpretation from being a possibility. He created everything that has been created. Therefore, he could not have been a created thing. By him, Paul said, all things were created. 
Now that probably is better translated, in him all things were created, since by him really doesn't say anything different from what Paul says at the end of the verse when he says that through him or by him all things have been created. But in him all things were created means he is the source of all things. The stuff of creation is from him. The plan of creation, its arrangement was in him. He is the architect of the universe. He's also the builder of the universe. All things were created by him or created through him. And Paul leaves nothing out of that. All things. He, I don't know that he could, how he could be more inclusive, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. If it was created, Christ created it, which logically excludes him from being among the things of creation. It means he's God. Now, that's not only the logic of the verse, it's supported by its language. The universe is through him and to him, Paul says. Now, that's an important expression. Because we find that in other places. For example, those are the words in Romans 11, verse 36. Paul's great doxology at the end of that, that, past, that portion of the book of Romans where he says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We have that same wording here. So then, the one who is... The Savior in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, is also the Creator. He is the Son of God, very God of very God. Only a person such as that, who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, would be sufficient to redeem us from sin and judgment. And only He is sufficient to protect us through this world. What are the threats to us in this world and in this life? What are the agents out there that are opposed to us? Well, Christ made them all. Thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, spiritual powers organized as government or armies. They can be hostile forces. In Ephesians 6, Paul speaks of the war that we have with spiritual forces and their fiery darts. But there are also forces of nature. And, and we find ourselves at times in overwhelming circumstances that, that confound us. We don't know how to deal with. We don't know how to, how to extract ourselves from them. They're overwhelming. But they don't confound him. He made them and is master over all. He, he's more than sufficient. The disciples learned that when he calmed the wind and the waves on the sea. And the application of this is obvious, I think. We need to trust him and obey him. And he's reliable. Paul supports that further in verse 17, a spectacular verse in which he describes the present sustaining power of Christ Jesus over the entire universe. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That is a statement of the deity of Christ. He is eternal. He is before all things. That means more than he's pre-existent. It means he is eternal, without beginning and without end. Go back before the beginning of all things, the Big Bang, if such a thing happened. But before the first nanosecond of the universe, Christ is. Present tense. The grammar here is important. He is and always is. He is eternal. And what he is doing 
is keeping everything that He created in existence. He sustains all things. That's what Paul says here. Were he to relax his will for a moment, everything would evaporate in an instant. Now we have little idea what all this involves. The cosmos is so vast and complex. We learn so much all the time. In fact, in the early 20th century, scientists thought the Milky Way was the universe. They didn't think anything, there was anything beyond it. Then Edwin Hubble's telescope found that other galaxies exist. At present, it's estimated that there are some 200 billion galaxies out there. Now, I checked that this morning on my computer, and there's also another figure that is a little bigger than that, and that's two trillion galaxies. So, whatever it is, I have a feeling that uh, in the years to come, they'll be expanding the number of galaxies that they're discovering out there. And you wonder, as you, as you read statistics like that, what is out there? It's vast. Scientists can study what is luminous in the universe, but that makes up about 5% of its contents. The, the rest is of dark matter and dark energy. And the person who discovered dark matter, Vera Rubin, said, we don't know what it is. So scientists really know very little about the universe. And the more we learn, the bigger the cosmos becomes, the more complicated and mysterious it becomes, and, and the less we know and understand it. Yet scientists, at least some scientists, are supremely confident about their understanding of it all. One of them wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal a year or so ago, Mario Livio. He said that Galileo and Newton looked on the universe as a morality play. In other words, it had purpose. The universe is... Uh, is created, it's God is behind it, and it's a moral universe. That has been replaced, he said, with a clockwork universe in which events are caused by conditions in the present, not goals for the future. Which I take to mean, it's just material. It's a great machine with no reason for being. So who is in charge? The cosmos. It's carrying us all along to nowhere and for no reason or purpose. That's pretty much a modern view of things, which is pretty bleak. How could anyone know that? That's just a statement of faith. It's not a statement of science to say this is just a big machine and there's no God behind it and there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's just here. That, that is a... Uh, uh, as I say, a statement of faith. How can anyone know that when we barely know more than five, are able to observe 5% of, of what is there? So I say a statement of faith, it's a statement of theology and not very good theology. And it comes from studying the wrong book. Theologians refer to nature as the big book and Scripture as the little book, or natural revelation is special revelation. Natural revelation does reveal a lot. We can look at the stars, and we can know there's a creator. That's what we're told from Psalm 19 and Romans chapter 1. It, it tells us enough to know that there is a creator of all of, of this. Uh, but we really can't know much more of it about the universe from the universe itself than that, some very basic understanding. 
It's the Bible who reveal, that reveals to us who God is and what He has done, what He has made, and that this universe does have purpose and it does have a glorious future. And God's people will be a part of it. That's our future. Our future is glory. And it is assured to be our future because Christ holds all things together by His power, and He is moving it all according to His sovereign will. According to His purpose. That is the all-sufficient God. That's the reason Paul revealed this. We're impressed, are we not, with the size of the universe? 200 billion galaxies or 2 trillion Galaxies all kind of blends in, in my thinking. But it's a lot, and it's vast, and it's big. It's bigger than I can comprehend, and uh, mysterious. But for all of that, and, and conceive of it as large as you want, as large as it is, it, it is tiny to the Lord God. Christ in His deity holds it all in His hand. He, he holds it on the tip of His cosmic finger, as it were. That's Isaiah 40, verse 15. And Paul revealed this to encourage us with confidence in Him. He holds all of creation together and He blesses us with the abundance of His creation. James said, every good and perfect gift is from above. Paul told Timothy, everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is, to be, if it is received with gratitude. And we should be grateful. God has, has made this world burgeoning with life. There's nothing like it, certainly in our solar system. There's been nothing discovered, anything like it out there beyond our solar system. This place is unique. It's burgeoning with life. He provides for His creatures daily, from bugs and sparrows to people and angels. He gives and sustains existence. Christ does that because He is head over it all, sovereign over the entire creation. He made it. He sustains it. But he's also head over his new creation, the church. That's what Paul says next. And because he is, we can be confident he will sustain us and provide for us, his people. He's also head of the body, the church. Paul often describes the church as the body of Christ. Just as every body has a head that governs it physically, Christ governs the church spiritually. He is the beginning, Paul says, the firstborn from the dead. He is head of the church as the risen Savior. He is head of the church as the one who triumphed over death and the forces of evil. He is the first to be resurrected. He's the only one to be resurrected, raised in a glorified body, but the first of many, the first fruits of many to come, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Christ is the beginning of the church in that He established it through His death. He is the head of the church, having been raised from the dead, and He is sovereign over the church. Now, this is vitally important for us to understand. Christ, not men, is the head of the church. The local church can only function well and remain faithful by looking to Christ, looking to Him for guidance and wisdom. Others, um, like Peter and the writer of Hebrews, call Him the chief shepherd and the great shepherd of the sheep, and the guardian of our souls. And we can't do better for ourselves than that, than Jesus Christ as our shepherd and guardian. We have 
the New Testament that states clearly and simply what the church is to do. It's not a complicated organization that God has set forth in the New Testament. And it's set forth clearly and simply. So we can understand how we are to structure ourselves in terms of government and function. We have the blueprint for it in the New Testament. And we are to look to that and follow that. But we must look to the Lord for wisdom and faithfulness to do it and trust Him to provide for us. Now that is a challenge. Christians live by faith, not by sight. And we can use that kind of expression. We can talk about things in that way. We live by faith, not by sight. That's difficult to do. Particularly when it gets, it gets to be challenging. But nevertheless, if we will look to Him in prayer and trust Him by obeying His Word, He will always prove Himself faithful to us and provide. Consider the things that Paul has written here in this passage. Certainly he's able to do that. Look, if he provides for the sparrows daily, won't he provide for us? Of course he will. We are to trust him. He is sufficient for every need and he's always faithful. But Paul reinforces that in verse 19 where he speaks of the fullness of Christ that is in Christ. In other words, He is sufficient for every need and challenge that we may face because He has the fullness. He lacks nothing. He has everything. Verse 19, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. The fullness is a reference to His deity. He is fully God. All of the divine attributes, all that we find in the Father, they're in the Son. All of the glory and the power of God, God the Father, are in Him, God the Son. He lacks nothing. Of course, the fullness has always been in, in Him as the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. But here, what Paul is speaking of is Christ the incarnate God, as the God-man. Deity dwelt in Him, and therefore the fullness of power to save was in Him, so that the head of the church, the great shepherd of the sheep, is adequate for all of our needs. All of the challenges that face us, if we simply look to Him. Now, all of this may have been aimed at the heretics, those men who had come to Colossae with their new teaching and who taught that we need the help of angels or cosmic forces for communion with God. And at death, when the soul travels from earth to the heavenly realm, we need the help of these angels and maybe the, the formulas and the magical words they had to get, a, get the soul past obstacles, whatever their teaching was on all of that. It was all a myth. And Paul is refuting all of that here, if, if not directly, certainly indirectly by the things that he's saying, that, that the fullness is in Christ. There's nothing lacking in Him. His person and His work are complete. Nothing stands between Him and us. Nothing can frustrate Him. As I say, he has the fullness. He lacks nothing. And I think we can apply this to the present. We don't need saints or priests or rituals of water to bring our prayers to God or to make us acceptable to heaven. Christ is the only mediator between God and man. That, that's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. That is explicit and that is clear. There is nothing lacking in Him or what He has done. He is sufficient. 
He's more than sufficient. He's already brought us to God. This is the, the reason that God was pleased for the fullness of deity to dwell in Christ, in the God-man, because through Him He has reconciled all things to Himself. Now, think of all that Paul has said so far about Christ. He is the revelation of God because He is God, God the Son. He possesses all of the attributes and power and glory of the Father. He is before all things because He is eternal and unchangeable. He created everything that is, both visible and invisible, material and spiritual. And He sustains it all, keeps it all in existence. He holds everything together. The, the vast universe is kept intact by His power and directed by His will. Dark matter and dark energy are not mysterious to Him. He made them, all of it. He constantly gives everything its life and existence. Isaiah said, He spread out the earth and gives breath to the people on it. Every breath you take is a gift from Christ. He is great and glorious and generous. Who can even begin to comprehend that? Even so, this is what God can do effortlessly. He is infinite and eternal. The universe is just a speck of dust to Him. What's really astonishing is that this same perfect, almighty person would leave His glory to become a creature and a servant at that in order to reconcile rebels to His Father. This word reconcile is an important word in the Bible. It means to make peace between two warring parties, to bring them together. This is what a mediator does. He is a, a middleman. He's a peacemaker. That's, that was Christ's mission. That's why God sent him into the world, to reconcile the world and the universe to God. In the next verses, in verses 21 and 22, Paul narrows his focus to Christ's reconciling activity in regard to man, mankind and redeeming fallen humanity. Here, he's more general and explains that God sent His Son to reconcile all things to Himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. His work has what F.F. F. Bruce called a cosmic significance. It will ultimately reconcile the cosmos, reconcile the universe. It's what Paul explained in, in more detail in Romans 8, where he said, the creation was subjected to futility due to man's sin. But it will be set free, he says, from corruption and into the glory of the children of God. That is the hope that is given to the entire universe. It's not going nowhere. The, the, the course of this universe, of the cosmos, is not to just someday burn out or fade away or just cease to exist. It's got a glorious destiny. Until then, Paul said in Romans 8, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. That, that, that is seen in everything from the thorns and thistles a farmer fights in his field to cosmic disturbances in deep space like stars exploding and black holes colliding. Everywhere from here to there displays disorder and indicates that things are not right. Things are not as they were supposed to be. But the sacrifice of Christ will fix even that. Paul says, He has made peace through the blood of His cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. He has done that. That's, a, that's an accomplished fact. It's been accomplished. It will yet to be 
applied. The Lord's sacrifice paid the penalty of our sin and in that way satisfied the justice of God so that man is forgiven and the curse for sin which affects nature now will in the future be lifted and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That's the glory that awaits this universe and that we are a part of. The work of Christ in creating and sustaining the universe is awe-inspiring. Should be if we reflect deeply upon it. It is an awesome thing. I think I've said before, we, we overuse that word awesome. Uh, and when you do that, it becomes rather common. But if anything's awesome, this is awesome. Who and what the Lord Jesus Christ is and has done. But his work in saving sinful humanity, redeeming the cosmos, is really the most remarkable thing. As remarkable as creating everything, sustaining everything, redeeming everything is truly what is remarkable. He sacrificed himself for us. Now, one who has done all of this from creation to redemption and reconciliation and who will bring about our glorification is one we can trust in now and always for everything. He's in control. Years ago, I was in the Atlanta airport. I'd returned from a long flight from Europe, I think probably from Romania. Been some years now. And I was standing in a line to check in for the final flight home. We were all running late and the line was long. While I was wondering if I'd make my flight, <clears throat> a man came running up, very anxious. He had a big briefcase, so I, he was delivering a paper somewhere and he was running late and he wanted to be at the front of the line. So he kind of moved along the line asking if he could have a place in that line. We were all wondering if we'd make our flight. But he ended up going to the very front and cutting in line, and he got his ticket, and very happily, I can remember seeing him smiling and laughing and walking off to the next terminal. Well, I finally got through and arrived at the domestic terminal. If you've ever been in Atlanta, Hartsfield Airport, you know, they, you'll go from terminal to terminal in these uh, trams or trains, and so I come to the, the terminal, I get out and I look, and there he is, he's standing there talking to uh, an airport employee, he had, was having a heated conversation, he'd gone to the wrong place, and he wasn't getting any help from this em employee, he was sort of ignoring him, and in frustration he looked up at the ceiling and he yelled, who is in charge here? and grabbed his big briefcase and ran off, I guess, in search of his lost gate. Who is in charge here? Well, I could have told him. I could have answered that question. Christ is in charge here and everywhere. And maybe he's teaching you not to be so self-centered and cut in line. But I didn't. Still, it's true. And for us who know Christ, that is a great comfort. Because when things seem out of control, we have this certain revelation that Christ is before all things and in Him all things hold together. So we can and should rest in Him. Live wisely. Plan for contingencies. Be active in being obedient, but don't despair when life turns difficult. Easy for the preacher to say that, I know. More difficult when you find yourself running late. Things seem to be out of order, but nevertheless, it's true. Shakespeare was right. The fault is not in our stars. They're the Lord's creation. He controls them. 
They don't control or influence us. We are not beholden to angels or planets or anything. But the rest of the quote is also true. The fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And that is especially true of man's separation from God. Sin has caused it, and it is our fault. And there's only one way to correct it. It's by recognizing our guilt, our fault, and turning to the only one who can save us, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has reconciled man with God through the cross. And all who trust in Him, who, who lay hold of Him through faith in Him, are reconciled at that moment. Made to be at peace with God. Made sons and daughters of God. And given a glorious destiny with this glorious future for the universe. That's ours in Christ. If you've not believed in Him, if you've not put your trust in Him, look to Him, trust in Him, and you who have, I hope it's everybody in here, rest in Him and live for Him. God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for this glorious text of Scripture that sets forth the greatness of Your Son, the sufficiency of Your Son. To even say sufficiency seems to be inadequate. He is sufficient, but He is so infinitely more than sufficient. That being the case, we can rest in Him and rely in, on Him and know that He's always faithful. There's nothing in this vast universe that can frustrate Him, can frustrate the Godhead. And by His work, You have reconciled us to Yourself. We are reconciled to the triune God. We give you praise and thanks for your grace that saves. And we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen.